Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about the faith of Abraham in the book of Romans. Before we begin anything, let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to study your word. We pray that you would bless us as we study the faith of Abraham, that we may learn something about righteousness by faith for ourselves. We pray that you would guide and direct us as we continue this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to start off by reading Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, which says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So um, often as we talk about the book of Romans and uh, you know even books like the book of Galatians, and we talk about this controversy between faith and salvation and uh, grace and salvation, and of course the, the, the appropriate... Um, nature of the law and how the law relates to salvation, uh, typically, you know, there are some out there that believe that the law uh, is no longer valid. But when Paul asks the question, uh, do we make void the law through faith, he answers his own question in, in, in responding, God forbid, or certainly not, as some translations put it, yea, we establish the law. So the purpose of the gospel was not to do away with or void the law, to make it of no effect, but rather to establish the very thing uh, that it uh, that it was set out to do in principle. So, it, it, rather than doing away with law, it actually establishes and and uh, and affirms uh, the things contained in the law. So, salvation is by faith alone, as we talked about in previous weeks. And if it, and Paul makes this argument um, using specific examples from the Old Testament in order to support his point and to get people to see that salvation really has always been by faith. So he's showing that this isn't just something new. So in other words, as, as a result of the gospel, as a result of the, uh, the New Testament and, and what Jesus accomplished, it's not that it used to be salvation by works and now it's salvation by faith. Paul makes the point that it's always been salvation by faith, even from the very beginning. Uh, it has never been salvation by, by works. In fact, for Paul, the idea of salvation by works is actually a perversion of the Old Testament gospel. To support this point, he says that, you know, he points out Abraham, and he says, if Abraham's works and law-keeping didn't justify him before God, then what hope do we have? So, uh, when you look at Abraham's works, Abraham wasn't perfect. In fact, when we, um, when we look at examples of, of, uh, of Abraham and, and his faith, especially starting out, we don't see too many good examples, you know, for... for uh, for instance, we, we can look at the situation with him and Abimelech, uh, where he uh, tries to pass Sarah off as his sister and not his wife, and it caused him some, some troubles and, uh, uh, that, that led to uh, him being rebuked. We also see instances, for example, where uh, when the promised uh, offspring did not come through Sarah, I guess when they expected it to come, um, Abraham and Sarah get together and Sarah suggests that they... Uh, use her handmaiden Hagar in order to create a, sa a surrogate son, uh, sorry, rather a surrogate son, uh, so that the promise could be f fulfilled through Ishmael. But we see that God again steps in and says, "No, this isn't how it's going to happen. You're going to have a, 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 a child through Sarah, your wife." So when we look at Abraham's works, granted he did step out on faith and he did leave his country uh, at one point, but we see that his works were definitely not perfect. Uh, so Abraham, even with um, you know, even, even though he was faithful in, in some in some ways, uh, certainly the law or law keeping rather could not justify him because Abraham was guilty and uh, was um, you know someone who needed uh, growth and, and transformation just like the rest of us. So that's why the point is made that Abraham's works and law keeping didn't justify him before God. And so, if, if even somebody who was faithful like Abraham, somebody who was a patriarch of, of, um, of, of the Old Testament faith, um, if, if his works couldn't justify him, then what hope do any of us have? So, three major stages in the plan of salvation are revealed in Romans chapter 4, four by Paul. First, of course, you have the promise of divine blessing. You have... Uh, the pro you know, and the promise of divine blessing is pretty much the same thing as um, you know the promise of receiving grace or God's unmerited favor. Uh, and the second one, uh, the human response to that promise, which is of course faith, 
So if once we receive the promise, once we receive God's grace, uh, we respond to it with faith. You know, we, we act accordingly. Uh, third, the divine pronouncement of righteousness credited to those who believe. So in other words, justification, uh, you know, where, where we are pronounced not guilty, we are pronounced righteous. Based on what Paul points out here, um, salvation is by grace. It's by God's unmerited favor, and it's unmerited because we can't do anything to earn it, and we don't deserve it. Um, and so, since it's not owed to us, since God doesn't give it to us out of debt, then it has to be by grace because uh, we don't deserve it. It's not something that God owes us. It's something that God chooses to do, even though we don't deserve it. So justification by faith um, can be seen in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Let's just go there for a moment. And he believed in the Lord, and he, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So now when we look at that word that says counted it to him, um, the word there that says counted is pretty much a math terminology, which implies that the individual is credited or accounted with something. Um, so rather than uh, Abraham deserving to be uh, credited or, or to be given righteousness. It's not that God owes uh, Abram uh, righteousness, but instead he accounts to him something that wasn't previously there. So in other words, Abraham didn't have righteousness to merit him salvation. Instead, God accounted it to him or credited it to him in spite of the fact that he didn't deserve it. And so God's unmerited favor was given to Abraham so we can see that salvation, even as far back as Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, was always by grace through faith and not because of someone deserving it. That's what makes it unmerited favor, which is what we call grace. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 3, verse 31, which says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God, uh, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So this point here shows us that God didn't do away with the law. He established it by enabling people to keep it. So that's the key thing that most people get. People think that the law is done away with. It's not done away with. Instead, God established it. And what does it mean to establish something? Well, if to void something means to make it of no effect, to uh, you know, to get rid of it essentially, to abolish it, to do to do away with it. So Paul points out clearly that the law is not made void or of no effect. Instead, he points out that the law is established. So what does it mean to establish something? You know, if the law is um, established in, in contrast to um, to void it, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the, the Greek word here in, in the passage that, that says uh, established, it comes from the Greek uh, histemi. Now, if you look up the definition, it means that something stands. It means that something is set up, uh, that something is staunch, uh, that it abides, or, or that it's uh, appointed, that it continues, it's established, it's held up. These words, um, or these definitions rather, seem to indicate that um, rather than the law being done away with, it's held up, it's established, it stands, it's, it's still valid. Now, it would be interesting to see where this Greek word appears elsewhere in Scripture, so I just uh, typed it in uh, to just do a quick search to see where else it appears in Scripture. And, let, and we, we find a couple of things in here that are, that are interesting that show us the meaning of this word uh, established uh, in other contexts. Um, so, histemi, as it appears in other contexts, uh, for example, Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, when they, heard, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which, uh, which they saw in the, in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the, ch the young child was. So, it's talking about the three wise men, or sorry, not the three, but the, the wise men, and how um, the star stood over the place where the child was. So, it remains there. Uh, so when you establish something, it remains, it stands firm. Matthew chapter 12, verse 26 says, And it and if Satan cast out Satan, his he is divided against himself, how shall how shall then his kingdom stand? So that word stand uh, it also is uh, histeme, which means to stand or to remain. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 16, But if he will not hear, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So in other words, when something is established, that means that, it's, that it remains, that, it, that it's firm, that it's, uh, you know, in, in good standing, that it's not uh, invalid, it's now, it's, it's now validated. Here's another interesting one, Matthew chapter 26, verse 15, 
And he said unto them, What will ye give me, and, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. So this is talking about Judas and how he was going to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And they covenanted with him. Histeme is used there for covenanted uh, with him for 30 pieces of silver. So in other words, they made a binding agreement. It's established. It's, it's a binding agreement. It still stands. And of course, they were um, bound to, uh, to pay him that money when he completed the task that they had asked him to do. When you look at these passages of scripture and you compare how the word established or histeme is used uh, in other contexts, it clearly means that something is established, that it's firm, that it remains, that it's uh, you know held up, uh, that it that it's uh, still valid. So when you apply that to Romans chapter three verse thirty one, you see that if the, the law is not made void, but rather it's established, it's held up, it still remains, it's still valid. Uh, so Romans chapter three verse thirty one shows that the law still remains a valid thing for Christians to uh, to adhere to. It's not something that has been done away and should be avoided or, or ignored. Basically, what Paul is suggesting here is that all God's moral commands must still be kept uh, just as, um, you know, uh, some churches teach today. Uh, there's a lot of churches out there that don't teach that the moral, that the moral law should be kept and that uh, they believe that the law has been done away with. But Paul here clearly says in Romans 3, verse 31, that the law isn't voided or done away with, but instead it's established, it still remains. And he's talking about the moral, uh, the moral law, the moral principles contained in the law. Even though that may be the case, it's also important for us to understand that for even those in the Old Testament who kept the law, uh, even the entire Old Testament uh, corpus of law, uh, they were never saved by the law. So there's, there's another um, reason why the law needs to be kept. It's not kept for the, for the, for the means of obtaining salvation, but it does serve another purpose, as we, as we began to talk about in previous weeks. So even in the Old Testament, a person was never saved by keeping the law. The religion of the Old Testament, uh, as, in, as it is in the New Testament, was always one of God's grace given to sinners by faith. It was never by works of law. Now let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. What shall we say then? that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has to have found. For if Abraham, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the, the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him who worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man who, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the, is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So in these passages, clearly Abraham and David were not just by works, but were people who had faith, and were justified because of it. So both Abraham and David are examples of people who were justified by faith and not by works. Abraham wasn't righteous because he, he, he did anything in particular. So it wasn't inherently Abraham doing something that allowed him to become righteous. So many of you may be thinking, for instance, about the fact that he offered up his son. But the Bible tells us that he was accounted righteous uh, many chapters before uh, he actually offers up Isaac. So we see, um, for example, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that, uh, that Abraham was accounted righteous uh, because of his faith. But uh, we don't see Abraham offering up his son, Isaac, until later, when that promise uh, that, that God had given him to, to, to have a, uh, an offspring was fulfilled. So the point shows us that it could not have been any particular work that Abraham did that earned him uh, you know, merit or favor with God. Instead, uh, it was given to him because of his faith. Uh, so he was given God's unmerited favor. He was given grace be through, through his faith. And then, uh, you know, shortly after, we see Abraham making a lot of mistakes, uh, as I mentioned before. But in spite of those mistakes, uh, God still worked through Abraham and, and brought about, uh, you know, the, the champion that we now know of, who um, eventually... Uh, he and his wife had uh, Isaac, um, even though they were up there in age. And we're talking about, you know, uh, one being 99, the other being 100. Now, David is another interesting example, because David wrote about being forgiven uh, and not imputed with sin. And this means that, uh, this means the, the works were, were, were not present, 
and that grace was then needed. So if, Ab if, if David was, was imputed with righteousness, that means that it was credited to, to him. So the same word that's used there for credited, uh, or imputed rather, is um, the same Greek word. So imputed, credited, or um, there's another term, accounted. Uh, all those words mean the same thing. So here in this passage, uh, we're told that David is saying, blessed is the man um, who is imputed with righteousness or credited with righteousness without works. Um, and then what's, another thing that's interesting is that David was a prime example because David certainly was a person who had some character flaws. I mean, he killed Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites. Um, you know, he, he um, took his wife and married her. So, uh, and if we look at the Psalms, um, we see a clear-cut example of how David uh, declared that he needed to be forgiven of his sins and have his iniquities covered uh, because he knew that, his, that, he, that he certainly wasn't deserving of, of God's grace and salvation. If David writes about being forgiven and not imputed with sin, in spite of the fact that you know he had done some things that were terribly wrong, this means that uh, the works were not present. David wasn't a perfect worker, worker. You know, he wasn't somebody who kept God's law perfectly without spot or without blemish, without flaw. Instead, uh, he needed grace just like the rest of us. Um, and so we see, like, for example, with, with Abraham. So Abraham was one person who, like, you know, if you looked at uh, ancient Jewish writings or, uh, you know, maybe those apocryphal books, um, one of the things that, that show their flaws is the fact that they all seem to um, exaggerate Abraham's righteousness and, and seem to suggest that Abraham was somehow more righteous than he really was. So, uh, you know, they, 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 for example, one book that I'm thinking of in particular pointed to Abraham as, you know, a, a, guy, a person who was perfect in works. And we can see clearly from the Old Testament that that was definitely not true. In fact, one Jewish writer suggested that Abraham was in need of no um, of, of no repentance. And we see that that's certainly not the case when we read the book of Genesis. But what's interesting is that even if you wanted to try to uh, suggest that Abraham was so perfect in works, David certainly was not. Uh, so when we look at uh, the stories of Abraham and David, we see two people who are in need of God's grace, just like people today, just like you and I. And so when we see individuals who need God's grace, uh, and how they weren't perfect in law keeping, then righteousness is impu imparted to them. Sorry, righteousness is imputed to them or, or credited to them, not because of their perfect works, but rather not not out of debt, as as if it was something that were owed to them, but rather out of grace, God's unmerited favor, which they uh, which they received through faith. So Abraham was accounted righteous because he believed God. The Old Testament itself teaches righteousness by faith, in in the example of Abraham. So essentially, what what, what we're what we're seeing here is that any implication that, that um, the law is somehow made, made void uh, is false. Um, instead, we find that the law is established. So grace is taught all the way throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament. Uh, it was never without grace that God saved. It was never because of people's perfect law keeping that they were saved. It's always been by grace. And even if we look at the sanctuary system, it was designed to represent how the sinner would be saved through grace. So, for example, a person was was morally bankrupt, and so uh, you know they would offer up their sacrifice by faith, uh, knowing that the blood of that of that sacrifice would make an atonement for their sins, and that God would accept it. Uh, but even when you look at that system, God doesn't have to accept the blood of bulls. There's nothing inherently so wonderful about the blood of, of, of bulls and goats and turtle doves and so forth that would merit a person's salvation. God was using that as a teaching tool to show them that they were saved by grace through their faith. And the faith that they, were, uh, that, that they had was in uh, the one who would come uh, represented by these, uh, by these sacrificial animals. Uh, and his blood would be what would be shed for human beings so that they could have life. And so they could have forgiveness and redemption. And, and, uh, and that blood would be the blood that makes an atonement for them. So every time a person offered up a sacrifice, by faith they were looking forward to the time when Christ would come, who would be their perfect sacrifice. So even the sanctuary rituals and, and, and offerings and so forth were an act of faith looking forward to that time. It wasn't inherently the blood of bulls and goats and so forth that could save or, or, or merit a person's salvation. In fact, uh, when people began to think that uh, you could do whatever you want just as long as you offered up sacrifice. God ended the sacrificial system and said, hey, you know, your, your sacrifices and your offerings are an abomination to me. It's, it, it's pointless. Who, who required these things at your hand? So David's restoration to divine favor 
uh, as an example of justification by faith um, is put forward by Paul and he shows us forgiveness as an act of God's grace. So rather than a person deserving God's forgiveness, uh, rather than a person earning it, uh, it's an act of unmerited favor. Even as far back as the Old Testament, the Jewish religion was always a religion of grace. Legalism was simply a perversion of uh, what was uh, originally intended. Uh, so, legalism is a, is a perversion of salvation by grace in the Old Testament. So, it was never God's intent to have legalism as a means of salvation, even in the Old Testament. So, if a person grasps the great news that justification is a gift from God, totally unmerited and totally undeserved, then it becomes easier and more natural for a person to turn the, the, the focus away from the individual and turn the focus on God, whose love and mercy uh, re, uh, draws us to... Uh, repentance and leads us to salvation uh, by grace through faith. So remember that uh, scripture tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, right? So it's not we in and of ourselves that are that are that are working towards repentance. It's God that leads us to repentance. We couldn't even repent of our past mistakes unless God was working on our hearts, unless the Holy Spirit was softening the human heart and bringing it to repentance. So uh, you know these things show us that salvation is truly an act of grace because. Without God in every step of the process, without God every step of the way, we can't even repent. We can't even seek God. Uh, that's why scripture tells us that, um, you know, there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good. There is none righteous. No, not one. I'm paraphrasing uh, Romans chapter 3. Uh, but, you know, when, when we look at that passage, it shows us that we're not even seeking God. Um, and so it's God that takes the initiative uh, to save humanity, not humanity that's taking the initiative to try to get back to God. And that shows us that salvation is truly God's unmerited favor as opposed to us working to obtain it. Because rather than us seeking after God, it's really God seeking after us. And that is what separates Christianity from any ancient religion of the world. Actually, I should say, I should say Judeo-Christianity because remember, uh, salvation uh, by grace through faith was also an Old Testament concept. So Ju Ju Judeo-Christianity is, um, is the only faith that Rather than man seeking after God, you have God seeking after man and, and drawing him to himself. So Paul points out that we are made righteous by faith when our lawless deeds are forgiven and sin is not imputed to us. That's what he points out, especially in verses 6 to 8 of Romans chapter 4. So we come in faith to Christ and we take hold of his merit and then we lay his sin, uh, then, and then we lay our sins on our sin bearer, and Christ acts as our sin bearer. He's the one who makes an atonement for us and bears the record of our sin. Uh, and, and we receive his pardon as a result. And it was for this cause that Christ came into the world, to be our sin bearer, uh, to, to be the object of our faith, and, and to pardon us from our past transgressions and mistakes. So the righteousness of Christ is, is credited to a repenting, believing sinner when uh, they come in faith and be believing and receive God's grace. And I think the point that Paul is largely trying to point out in, in Romans chapter 4 is that salvation by faith is something that isn't only for the Jew, but it's something that's also for the Gentile. Because if Abraham was a person who was justified by faith uh, before he was circumcised, and he became, uh, as, as Scripture points out, and even the promise in Genesis chapter uh, 15 that he would be the promise that he would be the father of many nations. It shows us that you see it's not just about Abraham being the father of the Jewish nation, but rather he was going to be the father of many nations. It, uh, actually, uh, the promise says that in all uh, that in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So that's not saying some of the nations. That, that's not saying the nations that he. Uh, bore physically, biologically, he's saying that in all, uh, in, in, in Abraham, all nations, so in thee and in thy seed, rather, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So that's showing us that um, salvation by faith is not just something for the Jew, but it's something for all the world, because God planned to um, use Abraham and his offspring uh, to be a blessing to the whole world. Let me just read that passage. Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, which says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, And in thy seed, talking about Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice.
So here you see that all uh, nations of the earth would be blessed. So that shows us that this is farther reaching. Salvation by grace through faith is farther reaching than just Abraham and those who are biological descendants of Abraham. But rather, all nations are supposed to prosper and benefit uh, from uh, Abraham's blessing. So this demonstrates to us that, uh, that uh, Abraham is the father, uh, or the forefather, rather, of salvation by grace through faith. Um, because he, you know, if, when we read his story, uh, God exemplified this process through uh, through Abraham. He showed us, uh, you know, uh, the, the pathway to, to, to salvation through, uh, through the story of Abraham. Uh, that, it would event, that salvation would come through his seed, of course, meaning, meaning Christ. Now, what this shows us is that Abraham is not just the forefather uh, in regard to salvation by faith for the Jew, but also for the Gentiles. And that is Paul's key point. Because remember, he's dealing with the issue of, of Jewish believers uh, discrediting Gentile believers and saying that unless you're more Jewish, unless you become completely Jewish and you follow all of our rituals and traditions, then you're not good enough for salvation. But if uh, Abraham um, is 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 uh, the example of of salvation by grace through faith, and he was 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 blessed and 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 received. Uh, and was imputed with righteousness or credited with righteousness before he was ever circumcised and kept the entire uh, the, the entire law, then it shows us that Gentiles who, like Abraham, believe also uh, can be credited with righteousness even while they don't they don't um, have all these uh, outward symbols and, and signs like circumcision uh, that were given to the Jewish people. And Abraham wasn't a Jew. Uh, Abraham. Uh, gave birth to Isaac, who uh, eventually gave birth to, to Jacob, who gave birth to the 12 tribes. Uh, but Abraham was not Jewish. And so if Abraham's not Jewish and he wasn't circumcised when he was credited with, uh, with, with righteousness, then that means that there's hope for uh, non-Jews who believe by faith like Abraham. And that is Paul's point in, verses, um, in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 4. Now let's take a look at um, verses 9 to 12, which says... Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that the that, that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal, or a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not uncirc though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also but who also walk in the in the steps of the of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had which he had being yet uncircumcised. So Paul pretty much lays out pretty much the same thing I was just saying that it's not. Um, the fact that he was um, credited or, or, or accounted as righteous before he was ever circumcised or performed any works shows us that salvation is by grace through faith because he, he, he didn't have to perform works first, first before receiving uh, that, Im that imputed righteousness. Instead, it was given to him the moment that he believed. And so the same thing is true of Gentiles, uh, you know, people who are not Jewish. Um, when, when a person believes... Uh, righteousness is imputed to them or is credited to, the, credited to them. Whether they're circumcised or not, it doesn't make a difference. And it, Paul also points out that circumcision was simply an outward sign or a seal of inward transformation. So for Paul, he's not suggesting that uh, a person had to do something first in order to receive righteousness. Instead, uh, the works that Abraham performed and, and the, the outward symbols like circumcision that were given to the Jewish people were simply an outward sign of a transformation that took place inwardly. So whether a person is circumcised or not, uh, they can still receive salvation by grace through faith. And when we take a look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, But we see Jesus, who, had, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So notice it says there that this, that this death that Jesus tasted was for every man. So Paul's emphasis in Romans chapter 4 is on the universality of salvation. It's for every person who believes. 
regardless of race or nationality. Christ's death was for, for all people, and it's access through faith. Now, if you look at um, Romans chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So in other words, it wasn't because of Abraham's perfect law keeping, because he hadn't kept the law at that point. Uh, he hadn't been circumcised. It wasn't Abraham's perfect law keeping that allowed him uh, to, be, be, to become the heir of the world. Um, but instead, it was righteousness, the righteousness of faith. And so in the same way, uh, we today who believe by faith, uh, even without, even before we've, we, uh, we, we, we've done anything moral, even before we've done anything to deserve it, once a person uh, believes by faith, then they're credited with righteousness. And, and the reality is that we can never do anything to deserve it. Uh, so you, a person can try to spend their whole life uh, doing great deeds to try to earn salvation, and it's just useless because there's nothing you can do to change your status. There's nothing you can do to, to change the fact that we're morally bankrupt before God because his standard is perfection. And so, like Abraham, when we believe, righteousness is credited to us. And it's the only way a person can ever be saved, because you'll never work perfect enough in order to merit salvation. So it can only be by grace through faith. And then, uh, once a person believes, then it's credited to them, or imputed to them, for righteousness. So righteousness always has to be by faith, and that is how Abraham became the heir of the world. He became the forefather of people credited with righteousness because he believed. Let's look at verses 14 to 17. So God made a promise to Abraham that he would be the heir of the world, and Abraham believed this promise. Um, he accepted the role also that it implied. So belief isn't just intellectual assent, but Abraham stepped forward by faith and acted as if he believed. So as a result, God accepted him and worked through him to save the world. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 14. We're looking at verse uh, 14 to 17, which says, For they which are of the law... Be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, for where, there, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that, not to, to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened or made alive the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So salvation can't be of the law, because the law only brings condemnation and wrath, since all, uh, all people break it. So the only way that the law could bring uh, salvation is if people kept it. But because everybody's guilty of breaking the law and nobody has ever worked perfectly, certainly not Abraham, uh, certainly not David, uh, so since everybody's guilty of breaking the law, then salvation can't be of the law because the law only brings wrath because everybody breaks it and therefore is under condemnation. Sorry, faith must be the means uh, because law only condemns us. And if it's and, and if of faith, it's open to non-Jews who, like Abraham, believe God and this fulfills the promise that Abraham, of Abraham being the father of many nations. So if, if faith um, is, is, the, is the, the means by which a person is saved, then uh, Gentiles who believe can also receive salvation. And that's Paul's point to the, to, uh, to the Jews. Uh, he's saying, hey, uh, just like Abraham could believe by faith and, and righteousness was imputed to him, anybody in any nation, anywhere who believes God can be, can be imputed with righteousness. Whereas if it were based on law, even the Jew would be condemned, because nobody keeps it. So the Jew, so Jewish believers uh, in Paul's time uh, probably took issue with, with uh, what Paul was saying. Many had come to believe that their salvation rested in how well they kept the law, even though uh, that was not the old, what the Old Testament taught. Uh, they believed something, in, uh, something different from uh, what the Old Testament actually said. Uh, you know, perhaps more study would, 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 was needed back then in order for them to rightly understand that salvation was by grace through faith. But somewhere along the line, legalism crept in and people began to distort the Old Testament gospel. So to remedy this, this misconception, Paul argues that Abraham, even prior to the law being given at Mount Sinai, received the promises, not by the works of the law, because the law didn't even exist then. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
So Abraham hadn't even received the law. He hadn't received the whole Torah system or the ceremonial laws and the rituals and so forth. He hadn't even been circumcised yet. None of this had happened. But instead, he was justified by faith. So faith has the ability to save a person, whereas the law only has the ability to condemn a person. Because it, the law reveals what sin is. And even it even uh, suggests that in, um, in uh, Romans chapter 4, uh, in verse 15, where it says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if the law doesn't exist, then nothing tells you what's right or wrong. And so if nothing tells you what's right or wrong, then you can't transgress something that's not there. Um, so, so it's showing us that uh, the law is the revealer of what sin is. When there's a law present, it reveals what sin is. And once you break it, knowing what it is, then you become uh, guilty and you're under condemnation. So the law only has power to condemn and show a person that they're in need of salvation, whereas faith has power to connect with God and, and, uh, and allow a person to receive grace. So many of the Jews of Paul's time and even prior uh, were seeking salvation through the very thing that leads to condemnation. Because if you're seeking salvation through the law, then a person uh, is condemned and not worthy of salvation and, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, worthy of death. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the wages of sin, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. And so if one transgresses the law, then the wages of that is death. And since every human being has, has, has transgressed the law, then every person is guilty and under condemnation. But notice the second half of that verse says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when, by faith, when we believe in Jesus Christ, uh, we receive the free gift from God that allows us to have salvation. So if Jews wish to be saved, uh, they would have to abandon trust in works for salvation and accept the Abrahamic promise now fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so Paul isn't suggesting here that works play no role at all in, in the salvation experience, but he's suggesting that, they play, that works are not what justify a person. So in other words, if a person truly has faith, for example, if you look at James, James, I think, points out clearly that faith without works is dead. And he's not saying that, that works inherently merit a person's salvation. He's pointing out that if a person truly has faith, then a person is going to act on what they profess to believe and what they profess to have faith in. So belief is followed by action. Uh, a person is going to do um, or act in accordance with what they profess to believe. So let's take, for example, baptism, right? If the inherent act of baptism saved a person, then that means that whether I believe, regardless of what's going on in my mind or what's going on in my heart, if I simply step into water and allow a person to put me under the water, then I'm saved. So if baptism was, in, was, was inherent, it was inherently an act uh, uh, that, that, that merited a person's salvation, uh, as in the Catholic Church, for example, where they call it a sacrament, then that uh, inherent act of me being baptized, regardless of what's going on in my heart, even if I plan to commit murder that night, uh, that inherent act of, of, of being baptized somehow merits me salvation. And that is what Paul was saying, uh, uh, was, was speaking against. Paul was saying, hey, it's not by works that a person is saved. Now, let's go to the faith route. If a person is uh, truly a believer in Christ, then uh, they're going to act in harmony with what they profess to believe. So if I believe that I must receive Christ, if I, if I believe I must repent of my sins, and, and give my heart to God, and, and, and join the household of faith, if I truly believe that, then that's going to lead me to take part in baptism. And if I take part in baptism, I'm not doing it just to do it. I'm doing it with the mindset of, of what God said uh, would take place uh, because of baptism. So, rather than the inherent act of baptism doing anything for me, it's the faith behind why I get baptism, uh, or why, why I get baptized, rather, uh, that, that connects with, the, with, with uh, the associated grace. So in other words, if by faith I step out and I say I believe everything that the gospel says, I want to repent of my sins, I want to be baptized, my works are following my faith. And it's the faith that's really saving. And it, the, 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 um, the outward demonstration of that faith is the works that I perform that demonstrate my act of faith or, or, or my, uh, my, my uh, sincere faith. So the inherent actions that a person does doesn't save a person. That's what Paul was talking about in, in, uh, in much of the book of Romans as well as in Galatians.
Uh, but when you tie in what James was talking about in regards to the relationship between faith and works, if a person truly believes something, they're going to act in accordance with what they believe. So if a person says that they believe something, but it doesn't follow through with their actions, then faith without works is dead. So even James wasn't suggesting that inherent works save a person. James was simply pointing out that if a person only professes belief, but it doesn't follow through with actions that are based on that belief, that that faith really isn't faith. Um, so Paul and, and, and James were really talking about the same thing from different angles. Neither one of them were suggesting that a person can inherently do any works and merit salvation because of the work that they did. Um, so for example, I can go to church and I can give the, 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 the uh, I can give a whole lot of money in the offering plate, but me giving a whole lot of, of money in the offering plate doesn't inherently merit me anything. It doesn't matter what I give in the offering plate. Rat, but on the other hand, if by faith I want to help the gospel, I want to, I want to uh, share some of what I have in order to um, carry forward the mission, uh, and by faith I step out on faith and I, and I give to that, uh, to, that, to that charity or I give to that, um, uh, to that effort that's going on in the church, um, then I've demonstrated my faith through my actions. So my, action, my, my faith isn't dead because it's demonstrated in what I do. And that's what James was talking about when he said faith without works is dead. Um, so really, what matters is the, is the, is the faith behind, uh, behind the action, not the action in and of itself. So uh, a person's works are not going to merit them salvation. It's faith that takes hold on it. And faith is going to lead to works because faith is demonstrated in what we do. So if a person truly believes God, then rather than totally disregard the law, they're, they're by faith going to do the things that please God. Because a person, uh, as scripture tells us, um, he that saith, says he loves me or abides in me and keepeth not my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let me just grab that text. John, uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 4, which says, He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So as you can see from this passage, it's showing us that if a person says that they have faith uh, and that they love God, um, but they don't keep God's commandments, uh, then the person is lying if, if you're suggesting that you have faith, uh, but it doesn't follow through with your actions. Uh, and that's what, what uh, Paul and James are talking about, uh, that granted, works don't inherently earn a person or merit a person's salvation, but at the same time, if a person says that they have faith, faith should be demonstrated in what they do. So having faith and, and uh, being obedient to the word of God is pretty much going hand in hand as far as Paul and James are concerned. If you truly believe, it's going to follow suit in what you do. And uh, if a person really loves God, if a person really has faith, then it's going to follow through with actions in keeping uh, the moral law. But if a person uh, truly doesn't have faith uh, and just saying that they do, then they'll, they may suggest or say that they have faith, but uh, it's not going to be um, seen in their actions. And then the other route, uh, which, is, which would be justification by works, is the idea that somehow it doesn't matter what I believe, uh, but because I do this work, because I, I've done X, Y, Z, uh, that means that I, um, that, that I have uh, uh, merited salvation because of my behavior, uh, which, is against, which is against what Paul was talking about. So that's, that kind of reminds me of, of uh, what Jesus said in regard to uh, you know, those, who, those who he would separate at his coming where uh, he would talk to a particular class of people and say, you know, uh, I was hungry, but you didn't give me anything to eat. I, I was uh, sick and you didn't come to visit me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Uh, and maybe he might be saying that to people who, who uh, were huge charity givers. Um, and so they may say, hey, well, you know, when didn't we do these things? And he'll say, you know, as much as you didn't do it to these, you know, uh, you did it not unto me. So. The point I guess that I'm trying to make here is that a person can go through their whole lives giving charities. Give, I mean, you think about famous people, for example. Some famous people are very general, uh, very very generous. You know, they may give charities. Uh, they may help out the poor. They may help out during times of disaster. Sometimes you hear on the news when there's disaster in different countries, like in Haiti or in Puerto Rico, celebrities go down there and they give large sums of money and they they do things to help out the community. But as great as that is. If a person doesn't accept Jesus Christ and doesn't believe the gospel by faith, even though they do all those great and wonderful things and they say, hey, I'm a good person, they can still be lost simply because they don't have Christ. So if you don't have Christ, it doesn't matter what you do.
it's not going to make a difference. It's not going to merit you salvation, no matter how much of a good person you might think you are. Without Christ, there is no salvation. And that sh that's, that's a, a prime example that shows us today with, with the world's mentality of being a quote-unquote good person, that a person's works don't mean squat when it comes to salvation. Uh, what you do doesn't make, doesn't, doesn't make you or, or, or break you in terms of uh, you know, somebody's works inherently earning them uh, a, 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 um, a, a shot at salvation. On the other hand, uh, if a person truly has faith, then their faith is going to lead them to do things that are good. So, if my faith leads me to help out those who are poor, who are, who are less fortunate, who, are, who have gone through disaster and hardship, then my faith is demonstrated by my works. But the works inherently don't save a person. There's, they're rather, rather than uh, a per, the works saving a person, they are a result of salvation. So because I have faith, these are the works that I might do. Uh, whereas when, if a person says that they, that they have so much faith, and it never leads them to do anything, and they're, dis, they're despondent or, or, or indifferent when it comes to the suffering of others, then how much faith do they really have? How much do they really believe the gospel if it doesn't lead to a transformation of the heart? Those illustrations help us to understand what Paul is talking about and the relationship between law and faith. Law can't merit a person's salvation, but rather law is a result of salvation. Uh, more, and when I say law, I'm talking about morality. Morality is a result of salvation, not something that earns it for you. And works, whether it be the works of the moral law or the works of kindness that a person does because of a transformed uh, character, uh, works are going to follow a person who truly has faith. So we have no power within ourselves, apart from God, to do any good works. In fact, the uh, scripture tells us that it's God who wills in us to, to will and to do his good, his good pleasure. So it's God who has to produce this transformation experience within the human heart. Um, and so if we truly have faith, uh, works are going to follow because God is doing the work of transformation within us. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 21 to 23, as we talked about in the previous lesson um, about a month or so ago, the law was our guard to bring us to faith, to show us our need of a Savior, um, and to show us that we're guilty and in, and in need of, of Jesus. And so... Um, the law has a function, and it's still valid today. The function is not to bring us, is, is not to uh, merit us salvation, but rather to show us our need of salvation. Uh, and and uh, when a person uh, believes by faith and, and receives salvation, then, and, then uh, that work of transformation begins with the Holy Spirit transforming an individual from within, and that will lead to outward works. So the promise of faith more fully revealed uh, through Christ, frees all of us who believe from being under the law or under its condemnation. Without faith and without grace, without the righteousness that comes by faith, being, uh, being under the law pretty much means that a person is under the burden and the condemnation of sin because everybody breaks the law. And without inward transformation, it's impossible to keep the law. And so we're, we're doomed to be guilty. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6 for a moment, which says, And hereby we do know that we, that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But, whosoever, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. So there you can see that faith uh, has to be followed by action. It's going to be followed by works of righteousness. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And if we look at Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 20, the Bible tells us, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law reveals what sin is. So the law shows uh, what sin is, and if we abide in Christ, we should walk as Christ walked. And Christ was obedient uh, to the law. He was obedient to the Father. Um, and he kept his commandments and abided in his love. And if we keep uh, God's commandments, then we also will abide in his love. And this is something that we can't do for ourselves. This is a transformation experience that has to be done by the work of the Holy Spirit within the human heart. So to sin is to transgress or to break God's law. Um, so if a person is in sin... Uh, then they're, they're in transgression of, of God's law. They're not showing um, the, the work of transformation being done within. Uh, so when a person is transformed, then God can enable the person 
uh, with the uh, power and capability to keep the law, not in their own strength, but in his strength. So, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 uh, tells us to obey Christ, that, that to obey Christ is to have the love of God perfected from within. So, did you catch that? 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that the love of, that, that um, I'm going to just read it one more time, just that particular verse. Verse 5 says, But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. So, if according to this passage, to obey Christ is to have the love of God perfected from within, this implies that not to obey means that the love is not perfected within us. So in other words, if a person is not in obedience with God's commandments, then God's love has not yet been perfected within them. That work of transformation is not yet done. An Irish writer uh, named uh, Jonathan Swift once wrote the following, But will any man say that if the words drinking, cheating, lying, stealing were by act of parliament ejected out of the English tongue and dictionaries, we should all awake next morning temperate, honest, and just lovers of truth. Is this a fair consequence? So in this, this uh, quote by uh, Jonathan Swift, he's basically saying, okay, if we were to take out uh, the words that define cheating, uh, lying, stealing, drinking, does that make cheating, lying, drinking, and stealing any less of a reality because we remove the terminology that's used to define them. Would cheating, drinking, stealing, and lying still be going on if we just didn't have the words that define what those things are? And obviously the obvious answer was, of course they would still be going on. So removing the words doesn't change anything. And in the same way, this connects with the gospel because removing the law uh, wouldn't change the acts of sin or transgression that displease God. So in other words, if I don't have words for lying, committing adultery, coveting, uh, dishonoring uh, uh, my, my parents, or uh, uh, bowing down to idols, if I simply just uh, do away with the law, that doesn't change the fact that in action, in practice, people are still doing the very things that the law condemns. So doing away with the law doesn't solve the problem of transgression of the law. Doing away with the law would just simply mean, okay, well, everything's okay. Everything that used to be a sin, everything that used to be wrong is now okay. And that's the direction that society is taking us today, where everybody's saying that the wrong thing is right, and that doing wrong, doing, doing, let us do evil that good may come. That's essentially the, the message that our world uh, is, is teaching people. But rather, when we look at the gospel, the law isn't void or done away with. Instead, the law serves its purpose of revealing what sin is and showing us that we need inward transformation. And the only way to get that inward transformation is by a relationship with Jesus Christ so that he'll send us his, in, his indwelling spirit to transform our lives and hearts. So if God's law has been abolished, lying, murder, stealing, uh, and any, any, any other sin would still, would still be, uh, would, would be okay. But rather, we see that these things are still wrong. And I mean, nobody would argue... Uh, even if they're not believers in Christianity, nobody would argue that lying, murdering, and stealing is wrong. So, if God's law has been changed, then the definition of sin would have to change also. So, if you change God's law, then you change the definition of sin, because sin is the transgression of the law. So, if God's law was done away with, then sin would also have to be done away with, which means that every immoral thing that we can do that would normally be find, defined as wrong would now be okay and right and justified. And obviously, that is not the message of the gospel. The gospel is a message of transformation, not God saying, okay, I give up, now let's just do all the things that you guys want to do. No. Instead, God, God, the gospel is all about God giving us the power to have a transformed life through the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to, 12, 7 to 10. 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 7 to 10 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, notice here uh, that... Actually, I'll read verse 10 before I make my comment. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So notice here that the, the gospel is telling us that God is giving us forgiveness of sins. He's not now okaying it and saying it's not sin anymore. He's giving us forgiveness of sin. 
And the second part is that he also, see, a lot of people forget the second part. He's not just forgiving, he's also cleansing us of the unrighteousness. In other words, he's washing it from us. He's removing it from the sinner. He's, he's, he's changing and transforming the person so that they no longer continue in unrighteousness. So the cleanse part is the work of the Holy Spirit where God transforms the person's life so that they now no longer live in sin, doing those things which would displease him. If we take a look at James chapter, four, chapter 1, verse um, 14 and 15, it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we see here that the New Testament defines that sin is when a person is drawn away from God and led into lust. But the gospel is saying that God is not only providing forgiveness, but he's also providing transforming power. He's also providing cleansing so that we now no longer continue down that path being drawn away by our, diver by our diverse lusts. Instead, God wants to transform our lives and to take us away from that. So the gospel really gives us a full remedy for the sin problem. Uh, and, that, and that remedy is in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ not only atones for sin, but it also allows the Holy Spirit to be sent to us so that we can be transformed and sanctified. So if there is no law, then there is no sin, and so there will be nothing for us to be saved from. But instead, we find the opposite, that there is a law, that the law is not void, and that, that kind of pretty much points to why there had to be an atoning sacrifice in order to cover the problem of sin. G if the law was done away, then Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross, because God would have just said, okay, forget about the law, let's just move forward. But that's not what happened. Instead, I think, I think that the death and resurrection of Jesus actually validates and, and supports uh, the law. It magnifies the law. Uh, as uh, the, the scripture says, Jesus, uh, in, the, in the prophecy about the Messiah, he was going to magnify the law and make it honorable. Well, the death and resurrection of Jesus does that because it shows that God couldn't just do away with the law. Um, instead, he had to provide salvation by grace through faith and so transform the human life that he would enable the human life to keep the law in God's strength, not in man's strength. So only in the context of the law and its validity does the gospel make sense. Um, the gospel tells us that Christ came to die so that we can be forgiven of our sins, and through his resurrection and uh, sending us the Holy Spirit, we can also be transformed. Well, you wouldn't need to transform a person um, unless the law was still valid. Because if, 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 if nothing is a sin anymore, then what do we need transformation for? Because there's no, I can't do anything wrong. But if uh, the law is still valid, then obviously transformation becomes a necessity because it's the only way that an individual can live in accordance with the law since in inherently we can't keep it ourselves in our own strength. So the cross shows us that the law can't be abrogated or changed. It couldn't be gotten rid of uh, and, and just ignored. Jesus' death shows us that if the law could have been changed or abrogated, it, it should have been done before the cross, definitely not after. So thus, this shows us that nothing shows the continuity or validity of the law more than does the cross and the death of Jesus Christ. And that's why salvation has to be by grace through faith, because if the law is not done away with, and we can't be saved through the law, and the law only condemns and brings wrath, then we, then we need faith in Jesus Christ and, his, and what he can do for us. In that, and when we talk about faith and grace, we're talking about what Christ does for us since we can't do it for ourselves. So it's only by faith in him that we receive the merit that's needed, that, that's credited to our account and imputed to us. It's only by, by his imputed righteousness that we can stand uh, justified before God because we don't have righteousness of our own. And it's only through the work of his, of his Holy Spirit that we can be transformed so that we can live a new and godly life uh, a life that demonstrates our faith. So removing the terms doesn't make a person holy. Changing definitions doesn't transform character. Instead, the law is perpetual. It's, it's, it, it continues even, even today. It's something that's still binding upon Christians. And so just like removing the dictionary words for drinking, cheating, lying, stealing, etc. Uh, couldn't change the fact that these things were still going on, in the same way, removing the law that people are still transgressing that which God does not approve of. Uh, and so the only way to get rid of drinking, cheating, lying, and stealing 
is for the person to change and to stop doing those things. And in the same way, the only way that a person can obey the law of God and keep its moral requirements is, is by inward transformation that is done through the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, we talked about the faith of Abraham and how uh, Paul pointed out that this was the only way uh, that a person could be saved by grace through faith. And um, we showed how salvation by grace through faith has always been the means by which God has saved, even in the Old Testament. And, uh, and that continues now even in the New Testament. And uh, it is a, something that, that is allowed for both, not only the Jew, but also to the Gentile, to the non-Jew. And so any believer, any person who hears this gospel message and who wants to give their heart to Christ uh, can by faith do that and receive pardon and forgiveness from Christ and also receive the Holy Spirit uh, to transform their lives uh, to become a new creation and to live in harmony and at, and at peace with God. All right? Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your saving grace. We thank you, Father, that uh, by faith we can reach out and that we can take hold of the salvation experience. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins and lead us away from temptation and unrighteousness and transform us from within that we can walk with you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.